what I want to start with is um, try to indicate where we are going with this design program and what, what it's really going to take to knock this uh, Darwinian idol over. And I, I think what I want to start with is just to say, I think what Darwinists have done is really hidden behind the complexities of living systems. Living systems are so complex that Darwinists do not really have a clue how these things could have formed by a gradual, detailed, step-by-step -step Darwinian pathway. So in a sense, what they do is they gesture at various intermediate systems that might have existed and then basically say, prove me wrong. Show me that it didn't happen that way. And so they put the burden of evidence on the design people when, in fact, the burden of evidence should be on them because these systems, by any standards, are, look like design systems. And so if they look designed, maybe indeed they are designed. Now, how can you challenge that, though? Because we are now in the minority. It's the Darwinists who hold the positions of power and influence and prestige uh, in the academic setting. So how do you overturn that way of looking at things? Well, as I said, I think they're hiding behind the complexities. Uh, in William Paley's day, the I, the mammalian eye was as good an example of design as you could find, and he made a design argument based on the eye. Along comes Darwin, along come his successors, and they say, look, there are all these different eyeballs out there in organisms. Slap them down on a table, draw arrows between them, those which are less complex to more complex. It evolved. End of story. That's it. Uh, and you see this, actually. There's a uh, book that was derived from the PBS Evolution series that came out in 2001. Carl Zimmer, The Triumph of Evolution. That triumph is not going to be around too much longer. But if you look at the cover, there are all these different eyeballs there. And the implication is, obviously, the eye evolved. Now, the eye is so complex. I mean, multicellular uh, layers and layers of complexity how are you going to get a handle on that evolutionarily? So what do we do as design theorists? Well, let's look at simpler systems that are still sufficiently complex so we can get a better handle on that. Now, where Behe took the analysis was to the subcellular level, looking at these irreducibly complex molecular machines, these complexes of cells. Now, what's happened with Behe? I mean, the biological community is not convinced by Behe's argument. What do they do? Well, the Darwinian mechanism, it's a divide and conquer strategy. You, you take a system, if you can find a subsystem of that system which performs some function, hey, you've divided the problem. Clearly it evolved, the, the more complex global system involved from that system which is embedded in it. End of story. No need to do any engineering work or any design work or anything. That's enough. It's to, enough to point to these intermediate systems but not give any detailed, testable, step-by-step -step scenario for how point A could have evolved by gradual means into point B. Nevertheless, that is enough to convince them because from their perspective, design is a non-starter, it's unthinkable, so this is the only way it could have happened. Now, there are ways of approaching these systems and getting a handle on them. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit about the probabilities involved. Mike actually got, to, spoke to that with this problem of interface compatibility with multi-protein uh, multi complexes. But where I think it's really going to come down to is not where, where we're going to see the Darwinian idol topple, is not even at the level of these irreducibly complex molecular machines. I mean, you, you look at the bacterial flagellum, you've got 20,000 protein subunits just in the filament. I mean, these, these, are, these are still pretty massive things, uh, massively complex uh, systems. And again, I think the Darwinist hides behind the complexity. Where I see it going, and I'm privy to some of this research, and I've been advertising it discreetly uh, in some of my writings, uh, Darwinists, I think, are not believing me at this point, but I'll, just to give you a sense of where it's going, and I think what it's really going to take to bring Darwinian Idol down, is, there is the analysis is going to go not just at the level of these protein complexes, but to individual proteins, into individual enzymes, and then some me uh, metabolic pathways of these enzymes, but 
even at the level of individual enzymes, looking at these systems and then seeing just how evolvable they are, how much they can be perturbed, what is the space, as it were, around these proteins, how sparsely is it populated of things that can be functional at all. You see, what you can do with these, when you're working at the level of individual proteins, you can start perturbing and then you can see what happens so that it's not just that there is something that this, that there is some system that this could have been initially, some function, so how do I want to put this? You perturb, and it's not that you get something else that could have served some biological function or have some catalytic properties. By perturbing, you destroy all possibility of biological functions. If you can find systems like that, then what you've shown is that you have something that is essentially unevolvable. Molecular Darwinism is dead at that point. Now that's an extremely powerful result because it's, it's what, what you need with, to keep Darwinism going is you always are borrowing functions. You're also always borrowing things that have functions. You have nothing to borrow from at that point. Okay, so that's where I, I think what we're doing is we're going to a level of analysis which is much simpler than certainly the eye, simpler than the molecular machines that Michael Behe is considering, and yet complex enough at which to make a design argument. And I think when that realization hits, I think we'll, we'll see this in about the next year or two years, that the, these results are going to become well known. Uh, I, I, think there's, I think it's going to be over for the Darwinists. Now, let me indicate briefly, though, also why I find Michael Behe's arguments very compelling, and just indicate a little bit of what sorts of probabilistic analyses can be done on these systems. They haven't been done in detail, uh, but I think the, I just want to indicate that there is an experimental research program to examine systems like this. Uh, Behe was looking at the problem of really interface compatibility. What you have is, with Darwinism, you're borrowing parts when you're trying to explain the evolution of some system. Now, the thing is, a Darwinian evolutionary process is a blind process. When Mike Behe and I were to, uh, at a debate at the American Museum of Natural History with Ken Miller and Robert Pennock, the debate was initially advertised as blind evolution or intelligent design. When we showed up there, the program guide that was handed out said evolution or intelligent design. Now, the word blind was dropped. Why was that? Well, I think it doesn't look that good if evolutionists advertise their theory as a theory of blind evolution. But it is a theory of blind evolution because the mechanisms of evolution are not future looking. Natural selection is an immediate gratification mechanism. It takes advantage of things that are present right now. It's an opportunist. It cannot look to the future. So it cannot do quality control or set up stand design standards which the organism, which the proteins must all obey so that they can interface compatibly. Imagine trying to take parts from a Zill motor plant in the old Soviet Union and a Cadillac plant in Detroit and trying to match nuts and bolts. Now, these things have emerged independently. They're not going to fit together. There's not going to be interface compatibility except by chance. And that's the sort of thing that Behe is looking at. But there are many other probabilistic hurdles. Availability, how do you get these proteins in the first place? That's where the analysis is going to be when I think the final knockdown argument is going to come for Darwinism, getting them. Synchronicity, getting the, getting the right proteins to form these complexes at the right time. Localization, getting them to the right place. Retention, keeping them at the right place. Interfering cross-reactions, keeping the wrong things out, which will destroy what you're trying to build. Interface compatibility. Proportionality, having the right amounts of the materials produced at the right, in, in the right proportions. With a bacterial flagellum, 20,000 protein subunits are going to be involved in that filament. That's not about 90, 95% of the structure. You have to have the right proportions. And then, uh, Order of assembly. These things have to be assembled in the right order. And just because you're assembling a subsystem of it in the right order doesn't mean that that order of assembly is going to apply when you have the whole system. And the thing is, again, evolution is working by cobbling things together. So you have all these, all these probabilistic hurdles. You can do experiments with this. You can get numbers. And I think that's where it's going. And as 
the research gets done and published, I think you're going to see this whole Darwinian house of cards come tumbling down. Thank you. I've, I've been instructed that as we use these microphones, we have to bring them very close to our mouths. Okay. I'm going to invite up our next speaker, uh, who's not a stranger to anybody who's been at this conference or involved in uh, the intelligent design movement or even following our movement. This is Jonathan Wells, the author of Icons of Evolution. Let's welcome up Dr. Wells. Actually, I'm going to sit here if that's OK. That's so I fine. can that's hit fine. the keys on this computer. Uh, I have only a few words to say, uh, sort of a footnote to uh, some of the things you saw in the video earlier about uh, the voyage inside the cell, some of the things that Mike Behe said, and uh, some of the things that I said earlier today. I think uh, it's time for intelligent design basically to move, to just uh, not get bogged down in uh, criticizing Darwinism, although I think that's a valid exercise and one that I have participated in. Uh, I think the real uh, future, the real joy, the real excitement will come from moving ahead with scientific research that is inspired by and guided by intelligent design. Uh, I talked about a little about that, uh, one aspect of that earlier today. And uh, right now, all I'd like to do is put up a couple of pictures of molecular motors. Since we're talking about molecular machines, uh, these are the three molecular motors that do the bulk of the work inside our cells. Uh, the first two bear a, a vague resemblance to each other. Uh, myosin does the work in your muscles. Kinesin moves things along microtubules like the inchworm that you saw in the video earlier. Dynein, which is larger than either of the first two, uh, moves the opposite direction along microtubules. And both kinesin and dynein are modified in many different ways to carry different cargoes. They're almost like uh, the, uh, the front part of a, an 18-wheeler. And on the back end, you can put just about anything on wheels and carry it across the country. And these are the trucks of our cells. So kinesin, here are four different kinds of kinesin moving along a microtubule. Uh, dynein, two different kinds of dynein moving the other direction along a microtubule, and myosin moving along a different kind of filament, an actin filament, uh, doing uh, in uh, lots of different kinds of work, but among others, the work in our muscles. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale, and I showed this earlier today, uh, on the left is the motor of the bacterial flagellum. On the right is a a row of dynein molecules. And the red ovals show you that the motor of the bacterial flagellum is about the same size as one dynein molecule. These are enormous uh, in cellular terms. They're also very powerful and very fast. Uh, and that's it. I, I'm just throwing those out as possible candidates for future research. I know there are many people in this group who are students in the sciences, biology and biophysics. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, just step out there and uh, do some exciting research, uh, reverse engineering, looking for the function of things that, uh, whose function has been neglected. And uh, I think there's a, a great future ahead of us for this. Thank you. Our last panelist speaker for the uh, evening is our friend, Dr. Paul Nelson. Paul will be speaking to the future uh, of this research program and some of the challenges that lie ahead. Let's welcome Paul. I want to um, take my few moments to describe what I think is the greatest challenge facing the intelligent design community, uh, 
the greatest obstacle, if you will, and this has already come up in several contexts so far in the conference, so I hope I can, I can be brief. And I want to do this by way of a metaphor or an analogy that I hope uh, will not offend anyone, but I, I want to try to, to be blunt to convey to you the importance of this challenge. Let's suppose you've got $20,000 to invest. You've come into some money and you want to invest it and get a return. So you drive to your local Merrill Lynch office here in Southern California and go inside. There's a gentleman sitting there behind the desk. Let's call him Jones. And uh, you sit down with your checkbook or your, your uh, financial folder and you say, I've got some money to invest. I want to get a decent return on this. So he reaches in his desk and pulls out a sheet of paper very quickly without really any reflection at all. And he says, OK, let's buy these equities and we'll invest in these bonds and you're going to get a very nice return indeed. Now, you're skeptical, but this guy's persuasive. This guy, Jones is, Jones, is persuasive. So you write him a check. He invests the money. Not only do you do well, you do fantastically well. You get a 40% return on your investment. Now, this goes on from one year to the next. Let's say three years have gone by. You're earning these amazing returns, and it's not a fraud. No federal agent shows up at your door. The money is really there in the bank. It's amazing. It's amazing that you're doing so well. This, is, this guy is making a lot of money for you with his, uh, his stock and bond tips. So after three years, your curiosity really gets the better of you. And on a Monday morning, you drive in there before anybody else shows up, and you go in with your cup of coffee, and you say, all right, Jones, level with me. How are you doing it? How am I getting these fantastic returns on my investment? And Jones says, well, you know, I was wondering when you were going to ask me that. <laughs> and he gets kind of a, a sheepish, you know, expression on his face. And he takes you in the back of the office into a little room. And there, standing on a perch, is a large gray parrot. And in front of the parrot is that day's stock table from the Wall Street Journal. And the parrot is pecking at that page. And Jones turns to you and he says, Wherever he punches through the paper, I write that down and I tell people to buy that stock. And I don't know how it happens, but we make a lot of money. Now, suspend your disbelief for a moment about the implausibility of this. Let's suppose the money really is there in your account. You know, your amazing 40% returns for three years. You've done quite well. You're standing there. Here's Jones, here's the parrot, there's the page from the Wall Street Journal. You don't believe it, but are you going to give the money back? <laughs> I'm not going to give the money back. The money is staying in my account. That's a real result. That's, that's a real yield. That's a very healthy yield. 40%, that's, you know, you usually only make that kind of a return on a stock fraud. <laughs> now, what's the moral here? Well, let me apply this to the intelligent design debate, which has been going on now. If we take the publication of Darwin on trial as a kind of convenient marker, 1991, the current intelligent design debate has been going on for well over a decade. And I think the panelists, and probably many of you will agree, it's locked in a kind of a holding pattern. This is not the first time tonight that you heard about molecular machines. Most of you, I think, a healthy percentage of this audience, finds that evidence compelling. The evidence that we heard earlier today uh, from other speakers, compelling evidence of design. Yet the scientific community itself is unpersuaded. They're unpersuaded. And they have two major criticisms of intelligent design. And these are intimately related to each other. The first one is that there's no independent evidence for the cause, namely the designer. We don't have any direct observational access to whatever being built that bacterial motor if that bacterial motor was in fact designed and built by an intelligence. So that's the first one. There's no independent evidence for the designer. And there are no novel results or findings stemming from intelligent design, independent of its criticisms of evolution. Uh, for years, I had a close friendship with a science writer named Bob Shadowald, uh, a skeptic of 
of intelligent design, in fact, a leading skeptic of intelligent design. And I stayed in his home in Minneapolis on a couple of occasions. And Bob, he's dead now. He died tragically early uh, of colon cancer. But he had a joke that he would pester me with when we would be sharing a beer or walking uh, around his uh, place where he lived in Minneapolis. And it went like this. Paul, tell me something about intelligent design. And he would do a little dialogue, himself and me. He'd say, and Paul said, Darwinian evolution stinks. And Bob would say, no, tell me something positive about intelligent design. And Paul would say, Darwinian evolution positively stinks. <laughs> In other words, tell me something I don't know. When I lecture on this topic uh, uh, around the country and interact with scientists, uh, many of them will come up to me after the Q&A, one-on-one, in fact, this, uh, I'll give you a, a particular instance of this. I was lecturing at Wayne State University in Detroit, and an RNA chemist, a Christian actually, self-identified Christian, he told me, came up to me after the lecture, and he said, Paul, I can accept pretty much everything you have to say in a negative vein about evolution. It's got a lot of problems. I know that. But what do you have to give me beyond that? What have you got? Most scientists are intensely pragmatic. What they want are results and they don't especially care how they get them because the way that you get grants and the way that you win prizes and the way that you make a reputation in science is by making discoveries and getting results. That's what you can take to the bank. So these criticisms are related. No independent evidence for the cause, the designer, and no results. And the reason there are no independent results is because you can't identify the cause, you can't describe it, and if you can't do that, you can't generate predictions that will yield discoveries. Now, hold in your bracket whether or not you find these criticisms acceptable or plausible. Let's just take them at face value. And let's go back to my parrot story. Suppose we had the results. In other words, the money was in the bank already. It's already there. Now, what's going to happen to that first objection, that first criticism? No independent evidence of the designer. Well, I think it's going to get a lot weaker. Results have a reality that speaks for itself. There they are. And the criticism, well, gee, you know, you haven't identified the designer, you haven't got them in a box where I can look at them. Yeah, that's true. But here are these discoveries that we made using intelligent design. And how about, you know, trying it out for yourself? It actually does work as a theory. Now, the problem that intelligent design faces is that the theory became plausible to a lot of people, many of you here in this room, it became plausible and compelling and rational before the discoveries were made. In other words, you're ready, you've got your checkbook, but you don't have the money in the bank yet. It's not there. It's not there. So we face a kind of reverse situation where we've if you will, hung out our investment advisor shingle and we're advertising this great investment scheme that we've got, but we don't have anything to show for it yet. So we face kind of the reverse situation. Now, the reason I bring this up is I think the intelligent design debate and the debate over the merits of many of the ideas that you'll hear at this conference is going to be stalled in a holding pattern until the people in this room who have the ability to do it begin to be brave and try to generate novel findings and discoveries on the basis of design. This afternoon, we heard one very powerful new idea that I'm hoping will be borne out uh, by experimental findings. But I'll make a prophecy. If intelligent design does not begin to yield novel findings of its own, intelligent design is going to begin to die. Here's why. Most scientists, and I think most rational people, who give the, the, give the idea any thought, find it very unlikely that a true theory would not tell you something surprising that you didn't already know on the basis of everything else that you had in your knowledge base. If intelligent design is true, there ought to be consequences, empirical consequences from that that you would not get from evolution or any other idea. It's very unlikely that if intelligent design is true, we cannot assemble a theory 
turn the crank and generate predictions that will be truly novel, that will really lead to discovery. I believe this can happen, but it will not happen without a lot of hard work and a lot of creativity, and I'll conclude with this, without a lot of bravery. You have to be brave, and you, you cannot be afraid to make a mistake. If you're afraid of making a mistake, science is the wrong enterprise to be in. Pick any great scientist, Darwin, I think Darwin was a great scientist, Newton, Kepler, Linnaeus, they all made mistakes. If you're afraid of making a mistake, don't go into science. But if you want an exciting project, take the idea of intelligent design and try to make it a tool for discovery. That's what will move this debate along. Well, thank you very much. As we uh, move into the question and answer time, I'd like to invite the sixth member of the uh, six pack that I talked about, Dr. Schaefer, to come and join us up here in case anybody has a question about how they can join in as a Christian in science. And uh, just one comment about the question and answer time. We, we really love the process of debate and uh, argument. What went on up here is very typical of what goes on in our hotel rooms uh, late at night at these conferences. We love that. But for the purpose of educating and bringing information to as many people as possible, keep your questions very short. Make sure they're questions, not statements. And, uh, and then please direct them to one of the people on the panel. If you don't have a person in particular, I'll pick the person. Uh, and then as people are making their way towards the front, please go ahead and get started. Um, I'd just like to, to make a comment on what Paul Nelson said. I find it very refreshing that in the intelligent design community, we have people who are willing to admit that our, our whole movement might even die tomorrow or, you know, in the near future. I, I just don't think that you'll find the same kind of, of gut checking going on in other uh, more established scientific communities. I, I, that, that's uh, a case, I mean, I'm, I'm in the other scientific communities as well and I see it going on. You, you won't hear a Darwinist say that Darwinism might die if they don't start making good predictions. Uh, but another comment about what Paul makes is, I spent a lot of time in the laboratory. I've been in the laboratory since I was 17 years old. I'm now 32. And I see a lot of things being discovered using an intelligent design perspective. And most of them are being discovered by Darwinists using an intelligent design perspective. And that's the refreshing thing is I'm not at all worried about Paul Nelson's prophecy because I've spent so much time in the laboratory and every good thing that has been discovered near me or by me or around me has always been, always been discovered using an intelligent design perspective. So I have no fear that what Jonathan uh, talked about this afternoon or what other people um, that you'll hear tomorrow if you go to the breakout sessions or people in cosmology, a field that I just look at with reverence, uh, no understanding. Uh, what they have proposed, like Jay Richards and, and Guillermo Gonzalez, all those things are already happening. So I'm not really worried about it, but it's nice to know that we are willing to be honest. And some of our members are so honest that it makes us a little nervous sometimes. <laughs> but let's go ahead for the first question here. and Go ahead and just uh, ask one of the people on the panel. This question is for Dr. Wells. Um, I guess Jet partially address this, but your hypothesis and your experiment, although you present it from the perspective as a hypothesis developed from the ID perspective, but I think a young scientist could always, or any scientist for that matter, could say that the experiment arose from the, the fundamental basis of scientific curiosity. So in fact, the experiment that you proposed, I think could have come out of any lab that is working on tubulin structure or cell replication. So I'd like to get your comments on that, partially in the sense that my understanding was that a scientist, a Christian scientist, can, can say that I believe in ID and also I can be a good scientist, or is your perspective that we should pursue a career completely focused from a perspective coming in the ID movement? Jonathan? What I suggested this afternoon was that uh, the intelligent design perspective could be more fruitful than a Darwinian perspective in 
uh, opening our eyes to solutions to certain problems. It doesn't mean one has to be an intelligent design advocate to find those solutions. One could just be, uh, what was it you called them, Jed? Uh, uh, the nosy, uh, honest scientist, right? That was Fred. That was, that was Fred. So Fred, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fred, the nosy, honest scientist. Someone with a good deal of native curiosity and without any ideolo ideological uh, axe to grind at all. People like that do make wonderful discoveries. Uh, I was merely suggesting that if one were going to operate within one of these two perspectives, neo-Darwinism or intelligent design, that at least the problem I described this afternoon, uh, the, a possible solution to that problem was encouraged more by a design perspective than by the neo-Darwinian one. You don't have to be an intelligent design advocate to be a scientist. I'm not saying that. I would say, however, since I like to start fights, <laughs> that I think being a Darwinian makes one a rather inferior scientist. Okay, uh, I believe you got to the microphone first. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Kyler, go ahead. Okay, uh, Paul, I wanna thank you for co your comments. So the, those are the best I've heard all day. Um, I. I was wondering if you have thoughts on, do we need intelligent design in the educational system to train up scientists who are willing to go down a limb and explore ideas of research program? And if you think that, it seems like we're in a catch-22 because we need the results to get accepted by mainstream science to get into education. But So what's your sort of resolution to that dilemma, I guess? Paul? Uh, um, it's a tough, Tough problem, Kyler, that you identify, but let me point out that intelligent design ideas get tremendous circulation. Our ideas get out there, and the reason they do, I think, is kind of strange. It's because Darwinism is the orthodoxy. If you want a kid to read something, tell him he's not allowed to do it in class. The, the best thing that ever happened for, for intelligent design is, is to be forbidden to be taught in public school classrooms. Um, I think the problem really is, is one of imagination, of lack of imagination. And I think that stems from what has been the destructive mode of the intelligent design community. For about the past decade, we have been engaged in tearing down the house of neo-Darwinism. Now, if I hired a contractor to build me a house, and I went to see how he was doing, and I, show, and I showed up, and it's just, you know, it's a flat plane of dirt. I'm going to say, Where, where's my house? And he goes, well, I got rid of the one that was here. No, you don't understand. I paid you the money to build me something. So the, the destructive and constructive dimensions of this problem have some relation to each other, but we are now at a position where we have to begin to build our own house. And we have. And we, we no, and I, 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 Jed, I'm not scared, but I have to challenge people, you know. Definitely. definitely. Uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, you may remember seeing uh, both Bill Dembski and, and uh, Paul Nelson here in this very auditorium. And that was to kick off a conference called the Research in Progress in Intelligent Design, which many of us took part in. And it was really exciting to see, even a year and a half ago, how much stuff was coming out of our laboratory. So it was really neat. Uh, we'll go ahead and take the question over here. Uh, this is a question for uh, Paul and maybe uh, some of the others on the panel, Mike B in particular, perhaps. Um, our opponents, and this addresses um, the issue that Paul raised about no independent evidence of a designer. And the argument that I heard a couple of years ago, and I hear it uh, frequently, the, the guy that made the uh, comment a couple of years ago is Mano Singham, who is a physicist, and he appeared on a panel at DDD3. And he said, ID fails as science because it does not have a mechanism. And uh, I have always, you know, I've thought about that question and it seems to me that in a sense uh, it doesn't have a mechanism because a mind <laughs> is not a mechanism. It's, it is a, uh, according to Jeff Schwartz, a mind is a non-material <laughs> substance, but it is a means. It is a means. And, and the question you're going and, to ask is? And uh, nature, it seems to me, is filled with minds that are 
natural, the natural pro they are natural products of the natural process. And so why, why should we uh, say there is no independent evidence of a mechanism for design because their nature is uh, uh, filled with minds? Why is it absurd to postulate the existence of a mind we can't see? We certainly do that in the SETI program. So I, I guess my question is why, why do we, why is that a problem? Because it seems to me the answer is there is a mechanism uh, or sort of a mechanism, it's a means and nature is filled with minds and so there's independent evidence. Mike, why yeah. don't you take that question? Um, I'm not gonna argue with you. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> that was Paul's, Paul's point. Uh, let me just take the opportunity though to, to say that uh, uh, Paul is a great guy, but I, I disagree with him on, on this score. Uh, uh, let me tell you how I view this situation. Um, the, everybody in the world up until 100 or so plus years ago thought that nature bespoke design and, and very loudly. And then uh, Darwin put forward his theory, and then people thought that natural selection would be able to account for the design that everybody saw. Uh, now we are 100 years down the road. We have discovered more and more and more sophisticated, elegant, intricate complexity in realms that Darwin didn't even know about. We've seen that Darwinian processes have been utterly unable to account for it. And so we are at the position where we see uh, apparently designed systems all around us. And we have no evidence that the claims of Darwinian evolution, or that Darwinian evolution can do what it claims to. So we're in the position of, of having systems that everybody acknowledges appear strongly to be designed, even you know Darwinists such as uh, Richard Dawkins, and only a promissory note for how unintelligent processes could uh, account for them. And I think the failure of the scientific community to accept design is simply a psychological difficulty. It's not a scientific one. And I myself don't think that we have to come up with some spiffy new uh, model or prediction or, or anything like that although I think that there are, you know, uh, there are certainly fruitful uh, paths one can pursue. Uh, rather, I think the, the uh, design movement uh, simply can, you know, point out or, uh, yeah, point out the implications of what science writ large is discovering in the cell. Desi the, the design movement did not come about because of anything I wrote, or even anything Phil Johnson wrote, or anything anybody up here wrote. It came about from the workaday progress of science. 50 years ago, we know, knew a whole lot less about the universe and about the cell. You know, chance processes, Darwinian processes, looked okay then. The more we know about things through the workaday processes of science, the more compelling design uh, appears. Okay, we'll take one more question from Dr. Gish. Yes, I just want to say, first of all, those of us at ICR tremendously appreciate this ID movement. We think the two people are making a tremendous contribution. We highly appreciate it. We sell your books at our seminars. Your books are listed in our catalogs. We, not, we want to know we greatly appreciate that. But I, and be, I want to read a very uh, short uh, statement, but I want to find out if you agree with Fred Heron that we ought to try to uh, build a bridge between ID and mainstream evolutionists. Now, before you answer that, I want to quote a statement by Ken Miller, one of those from the mainstream evolutionists. I, I think what he says is totally devoid of any intellectual content. This is what the man says. He says, okay, let's teach our children about intelligent design theory. What happens very quickly as we try to assemble a curriculum is you realize there is nothing to teach. 
Intelligent design theory is empty. Design theory, intelligent design theory is really nothing more than a set of half-baked arguments against evolutionary biology. It has no coherent theoretical or factual or scientific basis of its own, and once that is realized, the error comes out of the blimp. I don't understand how an intelligent, honest scientist could make a statement like that, because what you people are doing are contributing tremendous scientific empirical evidence to this ID movement. But then, in light of this, can we hope to build a bridge between the ID movement and mainstream evolutionists? Personally, I don't think there's a ghost of a chance that that's possible. I think I'll turn this last answer over to my friend D Bill Dembski. And uh, <laughs> is, there, is there a hope? No, I, I asked Bill because he's, asked, he's written a lot on this subject. And uh, I think he'll give you a pretty good answer. I, I have a few ideas of my own, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the connection between intelligent design and... Uh, Darwinism or Darwinian evolution, and I think of Darwinian evolution in very general terms. I mean, natural selection is the designer substitute. Any theory, materialistic theory of evolution is going to need natural selection. What you feed into it, the grist for the mill, what's going to be responsible for the, the variation? You know, it can be mutations, it can be symbiogenesis, it can, you can get it from Evo Devo, but that, I, I see that the fundamental conflict is between a materialistic form of evolution driven by natural selection and uh, and some form of real substantive teleology. Teleology or design that you can detect. Now, if you have those two camps, there is no marriage possible. Now, is it possible for a designer or an intelligence to work through some sort of uh, process of dissent with modification? Yes, it is, and there are various positions represented here. Mike Behe holds to full common descent, universal common ancestry. Paul Nelson is a young earth creationist. I'm still feeling my way here. But uh, I think the commitment on the part of intelligent design to the inadequacy of Darwinian theory, I, mean, I think that's, that's just total. And I don't see that as a purely critical or negative result. It is important science to see, to evaluate theories that are out there, to see limitations. You know, Darwinian theory is a theory of process. It's saying that a certain process is able to do a certain amount of design work. To assess that, and show the limitations, it seems to me, is a huge contribution to science, especially for a theory that, according to Daniel Dennett, is the greatest idea ever thought, beyond the theories of Einstein and Newton. Well, come on already. You know, it's not there. Thank you. <laughs>